Hello there, it's Christy Lewis from Dostoevsky in Space, and I'm here today with Silas Marner by George Eliot. I read this for a read-along very Victorian, I think it's called, that Kate Howe is putting on, and I'm just so grateful for her doing that, because I don't know when I ever would have picked this up. It's been on my shelf for, like, ever. I've never read anything by George Eliot. Now I have, and I can see why this is a favorite of so many people. Pretty short, 200 pages. It was first published in 1861, and it is set in rural England, and the author is from rural England. Silas Marner is a weaver. He starts off the story in a Christian congregation, maybe a Methodist congregation or something. I mean, it didn't really say specifically. In the, I think it was in the introduction or the afterword. It said it was a Methodist congregation. His best friend sets him up as a thief, and he gets thrown out of his congregation, and it kind of makes him lose his faith in God and in people. So he ends up in Ravelo, another catastrophe happens and he's just he has no more faith in humanity or god he just lives on his own and weaves he just works all day that's like his life's meaning now he just hoards his money and there's all kinds of rumors going around in the village about him and his hordes of money and he's just kind of viewed as kind of strange there's various misunderstandings going on around him about him and i think this state lasts around 19 years and then the catastrophe happens, and shortly thereafter, that's around two-thirds of the book, is when I got interested because something happens at that point in the book. So it took me a while to really fall in love with the book, but not to say that I wasn't really interested for the first two-thirds, because during those first two-thirds we see a lot of foibles of the humans that are living here, the peasantry, the gentry that live here. We particularly see Squire Cass and his sons and their failings as human beings. George Eliot is kind of saying throughout this book that riches doesn't make you better or happier essentially because the squire and his both of his sons, they're spoiled <laughs> as far as their character in a lot of ways. Even one of them, I think Godfrey is his name, who could have turned out to be kind of a good guy and you know he kind of does the best he can with his upbringing but he just didn't have the sort of moral training that he needed to become a good a better man. We follow Godfrey Cass around for a while and all of his troubles and then we focus back on Silas Marner as something crazy happens. And that crazy thing is, a little toddler wanders into the little shack belonging to Silas Marner to go warm herself at his fire and she just falls asleep there. He finds her there and he connects her with the catastrophe that he's been brooding over for a while and he sort of takes her as like a blessing that is in repayment of the catastrophe that happened to him. It's a stormy, dark night, he follows her footsteps out in the snow and finds that her mother has frozen to death out in the snow. So he ends up making a decision that changes his life and it changes a couple other lives as well. And let me just show you an image of a woodcut that an artist made that, that was in this book. This is the Reader's Digest edition of the book, but it's not condensed. It's not a condensed book. It's, it's just like a, they like put out a classics book series or something, I guess. The world's best reading. Here's a woodcut that was commissioned for this book. <laughs> Isn't that the cutest thing? That's Silas Marner, obviously. And there's the little baby, whom he names Epi, and I just feel like I'm gonna cry. I just, I really love this baby. But this is really what made the book for me, was the appearance of the baby in Silas Marner's life. And she's just the cutest thing! And she's like playing with her toes in this. That was, it was the description of her like playing with her little toes and stuff like that. It was just like, and about the appearance of this little baby in Silas Marner's life. The author says, In old days there were angels who came and took men by the hand and led them away from the city of destruction. We see no white-winged angels now, but yet men are led away from threatening destruction. A hand is put into theirs, which leads them forth gently towards a calm and bright land, so that they look no more backward. And the hand may be a little child's. And that's how it was for Silas Marner. <laughs> this book is told with a narrator. It's not really told specifically from anyone's point of view. It's a narrator dipping into several different heads. That's where the characterizations come from. It's because we can see not necessarily their stream of consciousness, what they're thinking, but we see what they are feeling and thinking and doing from the narrator's perspective. And the narrator has something to say about this peasant life, which George Eliot, or Marianne Evans actually is her name, because George Eliot is just a 
pseudonym, George Eliot did live in the country and she does know that peasants have a certain way of life that they're not miserable in this rural 1800s England. She actually thinks that people of humble station live more happily than people with luxury. She plays that out very firmly in this book. A lot of the people in the gentry end up having certain things not go their way and it really affects them. And then a lot of people in the peasantry end up being perfectly happy with their lives. They're just quite content. And in this case, the perfect love in which Silas raised Epi definitely made that the case. The tender and peculiar love with which Silas had reared her in almost inseparable companionship with himself, aided by the seclusion of their dwelling, had preserved her from the lowering influences of the village talk and habits, and had kept her mind in that freshness which is sometimes falsely supposed to be an invariable attribute of rusticity. Perfect love has a breath of poetry which can exalt the relations of the least instructed human beings, and this breath of poetry had surrounded Epi from the time when she had followed the bright gleam that beckoned her to Silas's hearth, so that it is not surprising if, in other things besides her delicate prettiness. She was not quite a common village maiden, but had a touch of refinement and fervor which came from no other teaching than that of tenderly nurtured, unvitiated feeling. The dialogue strengthens this sense of the pastoral, and it doesn't glamorize it at all. You're definitely seeing how peasantry live. It's not like some Homeric epic, and it doesn't pretend to be. It doesn't pretend to be like the tale of Job, which is pretty epic, right? Um, he never complains against God, but Silas Marner definitely does. <laughs> the dialogue can be a little bit difficult to read. There are a lot of kind of dialect things that you have to slow down to read and really understand, but it's totally worth it because it's usually really funny. <laughs> There's a scene where all these village people are in a tavern and I don't really know why it's there exactly, like other than just for setting an atmosphere where they're arguing about a ghost and, you know, whether they believe in ghosts or not. and. It's pretty funny. The characterizations remind me quite a bit of Hobbiton in Lord of the Rings. As the story goes on, we actually see more characterization of women, particularly gentle women, and I just really think that the author has an eye for that sort of thing. All their foibles and whatnot. <laughs> Overall, I really did love this, even though the beginning was a bit slow for me. I can definitely see why Kate Howe recommended it for a Christmas read. It just does kind of feel magical when baby Epi walks in. Just as like, really like salvation for Silas. He just gets reconnected with his whole community and with the church. That was an interesting dynamic because George Eliot actually rejected the church long before she wrote Silas Marner. So I read most of this actually on audiobook, but I did dip into the book several times during my nighttime reading. It was perfect like that. I loved listening on audio and getting all the accents and I loved digging into the book a little bit and making sure I wasn't missing anything and getting a real look at what was on the page because sometimes on audiobook I don't always catch every really incredible turn of phrase. I think that was a great way to read it and I would recommend it like that. I, I read a lot of books like that. Hello there guys. I just had to pop in here and show you guys my cute new earrings that I got from a thrift store. Don't they remind you of Snow White? No, that's not actually why I'm filming this. After I filmed my original review, a wonderful lady from my Christian Critics Book Club on Facebook, her name is Linda Roberts, commented saying that she did read Silas Marner. I thought I would read her review for you guys and talk about it a little bit. She really enjoyed this book. She says, I remember it was an English lit assignment in high school over 50 years ago, but didn't remember more than this old guy took in this little girl. Turns out it was so much more. Wading through the wordiness of that time period and the archaic dialogue took me a bit, but I thoroughly enjoyed how Elliot built the story, adding humor at times and bringing the story to a close. I'd give it three and a half to four stars. So I totally agree with like, yeah, everything about this review. The hardest thing about the story was dialogue, but it turned out to, to be more than any premise could have promised. Really, the descriptions of the girl and Silas Marner were really just what tugged at my heartstrings. And I just love the transformation that Epi affects on Silas Marner. And that's really cool that your teacher had you read this for an English lit assignment. We read some Shakespeare plays, but honestly, we didn't read that much English lit in high school. I don't think we read like any real English novels other than 1984. And that was like much later, obviously, that's a contemporary kind of modern book. We did read lots of modern fiction, most of it American modern fiction. Well, that was an interesting little insight into how things may have changed a little bit. Thank you so much for reading this with us. And this was such a fun read. I hope you guys want to read more classics with Kate Howe and 
with this book club and for anybody else out there who's interested I hope you will join us for more books. I really want to read George Eliot's Middlemarch. That's apparently her masterpiece, the big one. That's what I have had heard of before from George Eliot and, you know, knew of and wanted to read. But Kate Howe is doing another read-along for Romola in January. I just love reading along with people. I love seeing their reactions alongside mine and it's just fun if we get to talk about it. Okay guys, that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed this review and if you did, you can help me out a whole bunch by just pressing the little thumbs up like button or subscribing if you want to see more from me. And you can hit the little bell icon if you want to know anytime that I make a video. And I always love to hear from you in the comments. Let me know if you've read anything by George Eliot or if there's like authors similar to her that you would recommend or if you've read Silas Marner, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that as well. I just love to hear from you guys so much and to talk in the comments. That's right really part of what makes YouTube so much fun is talking together about books that we're reading. Talk to you guys soon. Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. <laughs> Bye.